We're now going to look at a couple of reagents that add to the alkene, and when they add to the alkene, both of the groups added are identical. So these would be what I would call a symmetric reagent. With symmetric reagents, we won't have to worry about regiochemistry because no matter what order they add in, you would always get the same product. The first one we're going to look at is catalytic hydrogenation, in which we're going to be adding H2. In our observed reaction, we start with an alkene, we use hydrogen gas, and then we use a metal catalyst. And we use the actual solid metal. So this is often called heterogeneous hydrogenation because we will have a liquid solution mixed with a metal catalyst, and so we will have two phases. The catalysts themselves will be either palladium, platinum, or nickel. They all work. They have slight differences among them. Um, in general, I probably most often used palladium, but really, depending on the circumstance, anyone can be appropriate. At the end of the reaction, we see that the double bond has become a single bond, and we've added a hydrogen to each carbon of the former double bond. So these metal catalysts are extremely efficient, and they are used in extremely small amounts, generally a thousandth of a mole per one mole of alkene. I've decided this year not to cover the mechanism of this reaction. It is interesting, but it probably isn't central for your understanding of organic chemistry. So we are instead going to move on to the stereochemistry, because this reaction has a very well-defined stereochemical outcome. If we look at an example, we are going to use a ring molecule, but we could just as easily use uh, an open chain molecule. The stereochemistry of this reaction is syn addition. Both of the hydrogens will attach on the same face of the alkene. So for example, in our ring molecule, we see that since we are looking at it from the perspective of having a flat ring, the top face would be the face closest toward us, and the bottom face would be the face farther away from us behind the plane of the paper. So if we add sin from the top, then what we observe is we get both hydrogens on a wedge because they are on the face closest to us. And once they add, these trigonal planar carbons in the alkene are going to become tetrahedral, and the other group that was attached, in this case a methyl or an ethyl, is going to be pushed away from the hydrogen that adds. So since the hydrogen is on a wedge, these groups will be pushed down to dashes. So this would be the syn top. But remember that, uh, that an alkene has two faces, so we could also add from the bottom face. And in that case, both of the hydrogens would go on dashes, and the groups that are already attached would be pushed forward onto wedges. Because we are creating chirality centers in these molecules, these would be mirror images of each other, as long as there is no other already existing chirality center. With regard to regiochemistry, as I mentioned previously, because this is a symmetric reagent, there are no regioisomers produced. The next reagent we're going to look at is halogens. Our observed reaction looks like this. Start with an alkene, treat it with elemental halogen. So in other words, Cl2 or Br2. We don't normally use fluorine for this as it is extremely reactive. And the iodine, while it adds, it's an equilibrium and it comes back off. So generally, we limit ourselves to either chlorine or bromine. If we observe how the reaction proceeds, 
the double bond is converted to a single bond, and then we add an atom of each halogen to each of the former atoms of the double bond. To understand how this works, we first have to look at what happens to a halogen when it's placed in a solution. So the halogen, if we look at it, it has these two very large halogen atoms with lots of lone pairs. So it's got a very large cloud of electrons. And the halogens we're working with, chlorine and bromine, are third and fourth row atoms, so their electron clouds are quite big. Now, electron clouds are not rigid. They're more like foam. And if you squeeze on one end, it'll compress, and sometimes it'll pop out on the other end. They experience these sort of forces when they move in solution and collide with other molecules. Because other molecules have electron clouds too, a collision involves the two electron clouds coming very close together to where the repulsive forces are so hard that they then repel each other. But as a result of a collision, just like when two cars collide, you get dents. What a dent then represents is a place where that electron cloud is temporarily thinner or lower electron density compared to its average. And that results in a slight positive charge showing on the surface. Now when you dent on one side, it's possible also to have a bump form in another place. And a bump represents a a situation where the electron cloud is now thicker than normal and has a partial negative. So what we create then is small dipoles, polar, small temporarily polar molecules. They're temporary because eventually, just like when you squeeze something made of foam, the foam expands back to its original shape, the electron cloud will expand back to its original shape and these partial charges will be lost. So we call this a collision-induced dipole. In fact, actually, it's we often call it a temporary collision-induced dipole. A dipole caused by a collision, and it's temporary. And we, and we re, uh, represent it like this. If we then bring this dipole close to the alkene, and bring the positive end close to the double bond, the double bond has electrons which can be attracted to the partial positive. Now we're going to look at this mechanism without regards to stereochemistry at first. Later on, we will cover the stereochemistry results of this. So right now I'm just drawing Lewis structures, not intending to show any kind of stereochemistry. What happens when the alkene approaches the halogen is the double bond breaks, that pair of electrons flows out and makes a bond to one of the halogens, the one with the positive charge. Now the halogen would prefer not to have five bonds, so at the same time as the double bond makes a bond on one side, the other halogen is pushed off as a leaving group. So this almost looks like an SN2 reaction, but there's a complication. As this double bond pair of electrons breaks, it will leave a positive charge on the other atom. Halogens are very large atoms, much like mercury was a very large atom. And the halogen has electron pairs that it can use to reach over and make a bond into the empty space for the carbocation. So that we get sort of this reshuffling of electrons. And what we get, generally accepted to be without an intermediate, is this intermediate right here. We get this three-membered ring molecule. The halogen has a positive charge because of formal charges. And this is called a cyclic halonium ion. Halogen, onium being positive charge. Now, the halogen itself is very electronegative. Then we put a positive charge on top of it. It's going to pull electrons toward it very strongly. So these carbons gain very large partial positive charges. These are large enough to be able to attract the halide ion that we created as a leaving group. The halide ion can come over as a nucleophile, 
make a bond to the positive charge on one of the carbons and push the pair of electrons out from the ring back onto the halogen. That creates our product. The overall stereochemistry of this process is anti-addition. In the first step, when the halogen, hal, I'm sorry, halonium ring is formed, it is formed with syn addition. The halogen adds more or less simultaneously to both carbons, and therefore it adds from the same face. Now, this could be either from the top face or the bottom face. I've depicted a an example alkene here from a side view. So this region would be the top, this region would be the bottom. And if the halogen adds from the top, we get a ring that looks like this, where now the new halogen ring bonds will push these groups down. Or we get a ring like this, where the new halogen ring bonds will push these groups up. At this point, then, the halide ion has a choice of which carbon to attack. So we're going to look at all four possibilities. But it turns out that the halide ion is not going to want to approach from the top because although it doesn't look like it in our representation, the large halogen of the halonium is going to essentially block approach of electrons to these carbons. Imagine it being a very large ring like this, or a very large atom like this, sort of covering that whole face. So instead, the halide ion is going to approach from the opposite side in a very SN2-like reaction. It approaches from the back side, it pushes out that bond as a leaving group, and these groups will be repelled up away from it. So let's look. If the halide ion approaches this carbon, you would break this bond, and these two groups would be pushed upward, and the halogen would be attached here. It would look like this. In contrast, if the halide ion approached this carbon, the bond would be broken in that direction, the left-hand halogen would be on the top, and the right-hand halogen would be on the bottom. That would look like this. If we approach the opposite halonium ion from the back side here on the left-hand carbon, we would get the halogen on the top face and the halogen from the ring on the bottom face it would look like this. And then similarly with D, if we approached here, these would be pushed down. The halogen would be here and here. We get that. I've labeled each approach with a letter and then matched those letters to the products that we get. And if you look carefully, you can see that product B and product C are identical, and product A and product D are identical. So effectively, we get two stereoisomeric products that, with regard to the two carbons of the former double bond, are mirror images of each other. Those will be enantiomers if there are no other chirality centers in the molecule. 